Danielle. Hello, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. How about yourself? I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for hosting. Yeah, we appreciate you stopping by. Um, I did a poll today on Instagram to see if uh, we had a lot of moms running us live or if some were going to have to catch the recording. I think I got about a little bit more going to have to catch the recording this evening, but that's why we do the recording. So, exactly. you know, moms are always on the go and can't make everything. So. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, thanks to those who are able to make it and to the moms who are watching after the fact. I know how busy mom life can be. So thanks so much for taking the time to watch the recording. Yeah. Well, so today the Peloton Moms Book Club is so excited to be chatting with Elle Cosimano for her first adult thriller, mystery, dark comedy novel. Finley Donovan is killing it. Um, I rated it five stars. I just loved it. I loved everything about it. Um, and so first off, just a few thank yous to get out of the way. Thank you to Jennifer Crowley for helping us bring in the authors and being the group's founder. Um, thank you to Lindsay Grabaki for sharing her Zoom account with us and making these recordings happen for the mamas who can't make it live. And thank you to Elle for her time this evening. So. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, Elle, let, I'm going to give the floor over to you, let you introduce yourself and kind of just give us the rundown on what you've written before, because I know you've written sure. a few other books that we may not know about and just yeah. let us know. Absolutely. Um, so I'm El Cosmano. You guys probably have had a chance to see this cover floating about on social media. And if you've had a chance to read the book, then thank you for, for uh, checking it out. Um, a lot of people don't realize that I've been writing for a long time and publishing for um, about 10 years. Um, but I came to adult mysteries from young adult literature. Um, so I have been writing young adult thrillers and mysteries and fantasy novels for quite some time. Um, my first, my debut came out in 2014. It was called Nearly Gone. It was nominated for an Edgar. Um, and uh, that was a duology uh, to also takes place in Northern Virginia. And um, there are some kind of cool uh, procedural and forensic elements in that um, set of books as well. And I wrote a, um, I guess you could call it a, a thriller mystery horror mashup called Holding Smoke, which was nominated for the Bram Stoker Award and, um, and the International Thriller Award. I've got a, for those who are fans of Outlander, um, I have a YA historical and contemporary mystery mashup. Uh, that's there's a little bit of a, a um, time element in there with a, a handsome young fellow from the 1700s who um, accidentally uh, ends up in modern day uh, Maryland and so that's kind of a historical mystery overlapped with the modern day mystery all connected to one very important piece of land um, and so uh, most recently I wrote Seasons of the Storm and Seasons of Chaos, and those are kind of urban fantasy. My, my books all kind of bend the genre lines. They're all sort of a little hard to define, and I think that's what keeps them really fun to write. And for my readers, I hope it, it's what keeps them fun to read. Um, if you can't figure out what shelf it belongs on, I probably wrote it. <laughs> so um, Seasons of the Storm is kind of an urban fantasy um, adventure, road trip, uh, sci-fi mashup. If you want to look at it that way, it's super fun. It's the personifications of the four seasons um, who are destined to kill each other every year for the next season to come into play and have its time on Earth. Um, but when uh, winter and spring accidentally fall in love, um, star star cross romance um, causes a revolution in the system, and it's super fun. Um, the sequel, Seasons of Chaos, actually just came out in June. And then, of course, we have Finley Donovan, who is, um, thanks to all of our very enthusiastic readers, going to be a series. We have book two scheduled to release on February 1st. I'm super excited. This book is so much fun. Um, and for those who have an opportunity to preview through Edelweiss or um, the early releases for reviewers and bloggers, I believe it did go up on Edelweiss today. Um, so that's really exciting. And we've just sold books three and four. So there are going to be lots more Finley Donovan um, and Vero books coming down the, uh, the, in the near future. And for those who aren't aware, we've also sold television options to 20th Television Studios, 
with Marlene King set to produce who, and she is the producer of the Pretty Little Liars um, series. And so I'm super excited about that. We've got a pilot episode written and now we're just looking for our Finley. So um, we have fingers crossed that we can get over some of these really big hurdles and, um, and bring it to, to the small screen. So we'll see what happens with that. Well, I know that I'm seeing our chat blow up. Everybody is super excited to hear that we're going to get more Finley and Vero. Um, well, you know, I normally get to that at the end, but since we're there already, let's, do you have any dream casting? I mean, I'm not sure how involved you are in the actual casting, but did you have anybody in mind, you know, in the, when you're writing this book, you thought, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be amazing if this turned into something and this is who you pictured or, or how did you come to that when you were writing? Did you have anybody in mind or? Yeah, you know, um, I did, I, not really, no, because um, there were maybe one or two characters that I could picture a, a particular, a very specific Hollywood face on, but um, I'm significantly older than, I mean, my kids are getting ready to go off to college. So I'm significantly older than Finley and Vero, and I'm not necessarily in the know with all of the amazing, very talented younger actors in Hollywood right now. So um, like my mom was so funny when she read it, she said, I could totally see Burt Reynolds as Nick. And I was like, that's kind of like, you know, we, we, we in our minds, we picture people from our own um, youth, our own time that, you know, whatever age we were when we identified most with that character. And I laughed so hard because that totally made sense to me. Um, so no, not, not really. I mean, I can see them very, very clearly in my own mind. Um, they, they really don't necessarily have a, a particular resemblance to anyone in Hollywood that I could identify. As far as actual casting goes, I try really hard not to answer this question because, um, because we are in conversations and reads right now. And social media has a way of taking one thing and blowing it up into something really exciting and phenomenal that really isn't happening. So um, I don't want anyone to take anything I say and, and and run off to the races with it. So I try not to answer that question. I can say that some phenomenal actresses have been um, reading for the role and we have our fingers crossed and I'm really, really hoping it's gonna be something special, so. Well, that's fantastic. Well, you know, we're coming up on fall. So do we think that any, is there any sort of timeline associated with this? Maybe next fall? None at all, because the way that these things work um, is the, uh, the producer has to write the episode and then sell it as a package to a network or a streamer or someone who's willing to broadcast it and put it on their channels. And so that's the next big step. Once we have the package kind of put together, once we have our, um, our kind of core cast sort of figured out at that point, we need someone to say, yes, we wanna, we think we can put this on our, on our stations and our followers and our viewers will love it. Um, and that is one of the biggest hurdles of all. So um, the best thing that I can say right now is that we have a lot of excitement for it. Um, we're very, very optimistic the more people read the book and you know tweet and share and check it out at their libraries and buy it and review it, um, all of that excitement helps build and um, increases the likelihood that we can get over that big hurdle. So we have our fingers crossed. We're, we're looking really optimistically right now. So well, that's fantastic. We will keep our fingers crossed as well. Um, I saw someone had said, Christina Hendricks is Finley and well, you know, she, Good Girls just got canceled. So maybe, you know, we'll fingers crossed for that. She was fantastic in Good Girls and that was- I love that show. Um, Dead to me, Good Girls, all of it. That's all my jam. I love those shows. So yeah. So um, going back to what you had talked about your backlist, you know, you had written a lot of YA. How does writing this novel kind of compare and contrast to the YA novels that you've written, whether it be process or storylines or just in general? That's a really great question. Um, in, I mean, the biggest contrast is the tone. And not because it's YA or adult, um, but more because we're talking comedy versus like, dark, suspenseful, angsty thrillers, where, where Finley is very, very light. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a romp, it's fast, it's pacey, it's fun. It does have its slower, poignant 
kind of moments where we're having a moment of introspection, but generally speaking, the tone is very different from anything I've written before. Um, all of my other books tend to be much darker, more um, typical thriller in the sense that there's a more ominous tone um, because they're um, about and for teenagers, there tends to be a lot of angst. Um, and so they, they feel different. In terms of the process of writing them, for me, it's very much the same. When I sit down to write a book, really what I'm starting with is character and asking my character, um, who are they at the beginning of the story and who do I need them to be by the end of the story? How are they gonna get there? What's standing in their way? What what circumstances and situations and hurdles are really gonna change them through the course of the story? So, um, you know, whether I'm asking that question of an adult in Finley's case or a young adult, um, you know, the process is the same. I'm asking him, who are you now and who are you going to be? and and what, what's causing that change through the course of the story. It's really just telling a story through a different lens. Um, and in, in the case of an adult story, it's telling it through the lens of someone with a little bit more life experience. Um, you know, with, with teens, the fun thing about writing for young adults and about young adults is, um, and, and what I love most about it is the self-discovery that happens in those stories. And so these are, are young people who are experiencing firsts. It's first love, it's first betrayal, it's first time away on their own. It's, um, it's you know, um, it, it's all of these wonderful life forming and kind of shaping experiences that, are, that they're experiencing for the very first time. But that's really not a lot different from Finley, who is now re-experiencing all of these things for the first time. As mothers and as women, we are constantly reinventing ourselves around our roles as caretakers, um, as spouses, as moms, as working partners, as friends. We're our 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 the way we see and define ourselves and, and our roles are constantly changing with the changes that happen and the growth of our children and the growths and, and in some cases degradations of our relationships. And so um, Finley is in a case where she is re-experiencing a lot of these firsts, you know, going out and kind of re-experiencing relationships and rebuilding new friendships after she's lost friendships through the divorce, um, rediscovering herself and who she wants to be. And, 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 um, and that's, for me, that was the excitement of writing Finley's character as I got to experience all of those firsts again with her, which was very fun. Mm -hmm. I loved the comedic aspects of this book. Um, I love rom-coms. I love what I, we call mom-coms. And to, to me, they're just always fast reads when you can throw a little bit of comedy into it. And um, I personally find dark comedy is kind of hard to write well. I just recently read one that I was like, wow, that wasn't, that was, that was a little too dark. Like there's a fine line of balance. Um, so how did you find that balance in Finley? I mean, I guess all of the, the random happenstances and yeah, you know, um, for me, I'm not even sure that there was necessarily a process or a rhyme or a reason or a scientific approach to any of that. For me, um, what I tried to do through the story, it, this is a wild romp. I mean, th there's no other way to describe it. This story is off the rails. There's, <laughs> there is there is so much um, in this story that is like, like teeters very, very close to slapsticky without actually going that far. And so for me, what was very important, you know, I'm asking my reader to go on this ride with me um, and to stay on this ride with me and to suspend their disbelief through it. And the way that I do that is to anchor them in a very, very relatable character. Um, it was essential for me that the people reading this book, specifically, you know, the um, the the women and the moms, um, could read this book and see something of themselves in this character and identify with her and relate with her, and if not that, at least sympathize um, and want to root for her. And as long as Finley was relatable and likable and um, and sympathetic and um, and real. 
Um, I believed that I could get the audience to get on this ride with me and take it all the way through to the end. And so I was kind of counting on myself to, in some cases, um, excavate very real pieces of my own voice as a mother, as a writer, um, and kind of infuse that real piece of myself um, into a character and make her make her real for you so that you would want to go on this crazy ride with her. Um, and so really for me, that was where I found the balance between the wild and the zany and the comedic um, and grounding it in this character that um, she became the anchor, her voice became the anchor for that comedy. I think you did a great job of making her relatable. I've, I've heard many times in the group that, you know, I could be friendly Donovan, except for the murdery bits. So <laughs> I think you did a great job with that. Um, was there anybody in particular that kind of inspired Finley, uh, the character that is? Um, I think there's a lot, there are a lot of people that I know that are a little bit Finley. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I kind of, when I create character, I'm stealing bits and pieces from all around me. Um, I've had friends who've gone through horrific divorces that are so much um, more horrible than anything I've, I could even imagine putting in Finley's book. Um, and so, you know, their pain and, and their experience, sure that shaped, um, you know, some of Finley's experience. Um, you know, be, I've been a mom. I have two children. They're they're 19 and 16. I have one getting ready to go off to college, and um, you know, but I and so they're a little bit older now. But I remember very vividly the long sleepless nights, and I remember the tantrums, and I remember the stress, and I remember um, the months and months when my husband was working overseas or you know away for work, and I was feeling very solo in my motherhood duties, and um, and the the kind of exhaustion. Um, um, and frustration that comes with that. So those, you know, I was able to take a lot of those from myself. The author voice was very much mine. Um, Finley's schedule is my schedule. I work at night when everyone's sleeping still. Like that's, I, I homeschool during the day, um, you know, and so I, and for the last two years, I've been working for two different publishers on two different series. So I, my workday starts right after dinner. I start writing at seven. I usually write till two or three in the morning. Um, and then during the day, I try to stay on top of my social media and my administrative and all of that. So that schedule, that fatigue is very, <laughs> is very much my own. Um, and the snark is my inner voice. So if you're, if you're hearing Finley talking to herself, that's how I, that's very much my own inner voice, um, which has never really made it into the books, into any of my books before. So that was kind of fun to sort of see all of that come together. I'm very, very lucky because I have an unbelievable partner of 30 years um, and um, I could not, you know, parent our children without him or do any of what I do or write books or any of that without him. He's super and he um, he's very, very supportive of my of me and my career and has always been. Um, so Finley and I don't share that, but um, but there are a lot of other aspects to her character that either came from myself or or um, my mom friends and my dear um, woman friends who have shared experiences with her. Wow, I, it's always interesting to hear um, writers who are moms still getting the mom stuff done and getting the writing done, just mm -hmm. finding the time and making it a priority and you sound like superwoman, so. You know what, there's no right way, you know, and, and um, you know, we're all, I think we're all just doing the best we can. We, you know, you just, you, you take it day by day and, um, and, you know, I hit the wall just like everybody else. There are days when I just can't get it done. And there are days, you know, I, I'm generally very, very organized and very structured and very disciplined. I'm very much a type A personality. And so there are things that Finley and I don't have in common in terms of how we manage our stress. But I do have my Finley days. And so that opening line of Finley Donovan, when she's talking about how most moms are ready to kill someone by 8.30 on any given morning, but on that morning she was ready by 7.45, I wrote that opening page on a Finley morning and we were um, camping, we were in a cabin somewhere on vacation and I had not 
read very carefully when I made the reservation that the loft where the the boys and my boys are big now. I mean, they're they're much bigger than I am. But the the loft where the boys were going to be sleeping, they'd be sharing like a futon. <laughs> so at like seven forty five in the morning, they're they're beating the crap out of each other. And like when I'd been up until like three o'clock in the morning writing, and all I wanted to do is sleep, you know. And I got up and I was like. I think I know where this story begins. You know, it's with a mom who's really losing it because um, that's how I was feeling in that moment. So yeah, I mean, you know, um, do I juggle? Yeah, I juggle. We all juggle. We do the best we can. They're 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 Finley moments in there for all of us. And um, yeah, and I tried to to have a little grace and and give her some um, give her some room to be real and to have those moments. And I think that's important. Definitely. Well, um, I read a lot of thrillers and mysteries. It's one of my favorite genres. And in those type of books, I think that pacing is just of the utmost importance. So what would you say your secret is to holding and maintaining and building and all of the things that go into writing a good mystery suspense thriller? For That's you? a fantastic question. Um, so a couple of things for me, um, the most important thing about pacing, I get distracted and bored very easily. Um, I have a very short attention span. Um, so when I sit down to write a book, if I'm bored while I'm writing, I know I've veered off track somewhere. Something isn't important enough, something isn't significant enough, it's time to cut. Um, so the second part, or either that or just like step away from it and come back to it with fresh eyes and figure out what needs to go. Um, and so the biggest part of my process doesn't happen in the writing. The biggest part of my process actually happens in revision. Um, and so I'm a very fast drafter. I can, I can like Finley, I can knock out a book pr pretty quickly, but I can spend twice as many months revising a book as I ever would coming up with the concept of the story. And that's really for me where the real work begins. That's where I'm excavating and mining for theme. That's where I'm really analyzing character and voice. That's where I'm cutting. Um, I do so much pruning in revision. Um, so um, essentially what I'm doing is going back through that book and I'm peeling away anything that is absolutely not necessary. If there, if there are extra words, they go. If there are extra descriptive paragraphs that we don't need, they go. If there's anything redundant, they go. If it's anything that's not pulling its weight and moving the plot forward or revealing something important about character or setting or plot, it goes. And so with every pass, um, you know, I, I like to say that there are sculptors and there are whittlers in writing. So some people start with the wire skeleton and add clay and add clay and add clay until they get the shape of the story that they want. And some of us start with a big stick and whittle and whittle and whittle until we get it down to something that's smooth and soft and shiny and exactly what we want. I'm a whittler. So I start with way, way, way too many words. And then I have to pare it back and pare it back and pare it back until I get to the core and the heart of the story. And that's when I start going back and building back in the important thematic elements, tying important, um, important clues into the story, making sure that I've said all of the important things about these characters and their growth that I wanna say. Um, and then finally at the end, kind of taking a, a, a polishing you know, rag to it and making it um, easy for you to read. So, or as easy as I can. Um, so that's kind of my process, but I do think the most critical thing in pacing is getting rid of anything extraneous. Um, if it's not pulling the story forward and if it's bogging you down and if you have to stop to reread it, it goes. So, um, and that's really kind of where I find I do most of my work is, is nailing down that pacing. Well, and um, we've got a lot of people that like the analogy of the whittlers um, okay. and the clay makers. Uh, you should be an editor. <laughs> um, so was Finley Donovan is Killing It, was that always the title of the book or? Nope. Mm -mm. I'm terrible <laughs> with titles. Um, actually, what's really funny is there's this book is so meta. Everything about this book is so meta. So in the book, Finley writes a novel. 
And the novel that she writes has the name The Hit by Fiona Donahue, which is her pen name. Well, the original working title of this book was The Hit. So, um, and of course I sent it to my agent. She was like, it, we need a better title, but we couldn't think of anything. I couldn't think of anything. My editor was the brilliant mind who came up with the title. She's amazing. And we, as soon as we all heard it, we're like, oh yeah. Oh, that's the title of this book. So um, I'm very, very grateful for her for that and among many other things. But yeah, so every book has what we call a working title, um, you know, when it's when it's kind of a in its drafty stages. And sometimes for us, it's just, you know, sometimes it's the setting, like the name of where it takes place. Um, other times it's like a, a like a, a word or something that'll help us remember when we open our word documents which one we're supposed to open but the the titles um just like the covers are typically um decided in a group setting um from an editorial standpoint at the publishers and sometimes we get lucky and they like the, the titles that we're working with more often than not they get changed so gotcha. um when you were going through your process, did you have, um, you know, separate and apart from your editors, I, we, we recently spoke with a, another author who said, she, you know, she had a group of friends that she would write with. So like writers helping writers or getting feedback. Do you have, did you have anybody like that for the, for Finley? I do. Um, and if you've read the acknowledgements, then you know that there are some very, very special ladies in my life. Um, my critique partners um, had, we've been writing together um, side by side for more than 10 years. We, we all three came into this business right around the same time. We were all mothers of multiple children, right? Very close in age. We were all, none of us had any professional training in this at all. Like I came from real estate. I had zero writing experience, training background. I came into this completely cold. So we were all coming in kind of at the same time. Hey buddy. <laughs> No, he's fine. It's awesome. Um, so we came into this together and we had no idea what we were doing. And so our agent kind of paired us up and said, why don't you guys go help each other, figure this out. And we found that we had so much in common and we just loved spending time together and we loved making stories together. And so we became critique partners and we've been critique partners for more than 10 years. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. So I dedicated this book to Megan and Ashley. Um, and they were the ones who were with me when I first came up with the concept for Finley Donovan in a Panera while we were at lunch, um, hashing out some plot issues on a murdery book that I was working on. And so we were, um, we try to get together in real life about once a year, sometimes twice a year if we're lucky, for a little retreat. And we use those times to plot books, to talk about family, to escape family, to, um, you know, to, to be together. And um, so it was my turn to kind of hash through a particular plot dilemma. And um, it happened to be um, a story with magical elements and I was struggling over what the rules of this world, I had to find someone who was going to die. It had to be a violent, awful, horrible death. And then I had to figure out what happens with the blood. Like does the blood just magically disappear in this situation? Does someone have to come and clean it up? Like, you know, there are all these magical world building kind of rules you have to hash through. But it was very clear that the people sitting on either side of that of us were not aware that we were discussing fictional situations. And so the woman beside us just she just blanched. I mean, she just looked so uncomfortable. And so we got a big kick out of that. And later that night, we were uh, sitting around dinner talking about it. And one of Ashley's cousins asked the question, and she said, "Wouldn't it have been funny if they thought you were contract killers?" And I was like, Oh, this is like the most amazing book idea ever. And I tried to get my critique partners to write this book. And I told them, I was like, this is not in my wheelhouse. I've never written anything like this. I don't think I can do it. Um, I need one of you to write this book because I really want to read it. And so I was trying to convince them to do it. And they said, no, Al, this is, this is you. This is your book. You're going to do this. And I think if there was any inspiration for Vero's character, it was from my relationship with these two women who um, are constantly pushing me outside of my comfort zone with this unconditional support. Um, you know, and that's really who Vero is to Finley. She's pushing her outside of her comfort zone. She's telling her to do things that make her uncomfortable 
but it's always calculated and it's always with complete faith um, in her capabilities. And, um, and so for me, like that, that was the birth of Finley Donovan. La that night we went back to the hotel and we put on our pajamas and we ate Twizzlers and gummy bears and drank a lot of wine and bourbon. And we came up with the concept for Finley Donovan. And, you know, within hours I had her character kind of sketched out and the basic premise in place. And I said, are, am I doing, am I really doing this? What are we doing? And they're like, you're really doing this. Go write a book. So, um, so that, that was where Finley Donovan came from. Wow. And, you know, Finley and Vero, I think are their, their friendship is really a central key in the book. They are literally partners in crime. And like you said, supporting each other, balancing each other, also challenging each other when need be. And yeah, I, I think you just kind of touched on it, but one of my questions was, you know, how did you go about creating, writing that particular friendship? I remember the review I wrote was, you know, I can't wait to visit uh, Finley and Barrow again together, like the crime fighting duo or <laughs> their, <contract> duo. <laughs> their dynamic for me was always the core and the crux of the story. I didn't realize it when I started. I didn't discover well, I didn't realize they were going to do this together and I didn't discover how good they are together until I started writing that scene in the garage. Mm -hmm. And if I'm spoiling for anyone, I'm sorry. Um, but when, when Finley is in the garage, you know, part of my job as a writer is I've got to throw as many stumbling blocks in front of my characters as I can. I mean, that's, they've got to overcome things. I can't make this easy. If it was easy for her to get away with murder, no one would read it. You know, this got to be tough. So she's in the garage and she's got Harris Mickler and, she, you know, it, something has to happen. Something has to make this difficult for her. Someone has to catch her in the act. Who's it going to be? And, um, and that's when Vera walked in and when I started writing that scene, the dialogue just came so fast. It didn't, very little of it changed in that scene from, from start to, to finished draft. Um, it came so easily and their dynamic felt so good. And it just felt so natural and right that they would be these two very different people who connect in really important ways. Um, and find that they work well together um, and then build the relationship from there. And, um, but it just that the chemistry between them on the page in that one scene was when it occurred to me that this was gonna be a story about two women doing this together. And, um, and that's really when I fell in love with the story. And I, at that point I couldn't have walked away from it. Um, Finley has a few love interests in the book. Uh, which one is your favorite, Nick the detective or Julian the bartender law student? I am team Vero. Um, <laughs> everyone asks me this. Um, you know, it's funny, like, um, I don't see this as a love triangle. I never did. Um, I see this as a, a, a friendship you know, between two women who, and that's really at the heart, like I said, at the crux, the core of the story are these two women. For me, the, the, what these two men offer was an opportunity to Finley, for Finley to realize she has choices. It was very, very important for me that at the end of the story, that by the end of the story, Finley realized that regardless of what happened with Stephen and, and who he is and what he's done, that she is desirable, that um, that there that she's not stuck, um, and that she can make choices for herself, and that there are choices available to her. And so, for me, it was never about, you know, was it Nick or was it Julian? It was always about Finley. Um, making a, that there would be a revelation, like a growth in her character, where suddenly she stops looking at herself as being the reason that Stephen was gone, that she wasn't enough for him, that, um, that there is a moment when she realizes that she's everything um, and she has choices. And so for me, I wanted her to have more than one. And, <laughs> and I thought that these were two really fun choices. And I think the other thing that's important as I'm, I've already finished the second book, it's um, already out to the typesetters and the printers getting ready for you all to read it. And I'm already work, hard at work on book three. But when I was drafting book two, I also kept in mind 
that it's important that women know that those choices can change and they are not um, bound, you know, to, you know, make these choices before they're ready and that, you know, there's nothing wrong with a woman who wants to explore those choices a little bit. So I will say both the gentlemen come back in book two. Um, and, you know, there you go. That's all I'm going to say about that. I adore them. I adore them both, though, for different reasons. So if that helps, like I just, um, I found them both really, really fun. And, um, and they each brought something really, really special to the book. And they brought something, um, I think they, they both contributed to um, Finley's growth in a lot of ways. And, uh, but at the end of the day, really, Finley could have told them both to leave and pound sand and, and stayed home and had pizza and beer and cookies with Pharaoh. And I would have been very happy with that ending too, so. Well, I, I love to hear that they're both coming back, but I also love that Finley is everything. Like, and I, and I liked how you, fin, I'm your team Finley and Vero. Um, I asked the question because I'm a lawyer and my husband is a cop. So having both of those love <laughs> interests be something that I'm familiar with, I was like, okay, well, I'll, clearly I have to be team Nick, so. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So book two is done. Did you write it during the pandemic? And if so, did, you know, how was that process? Did any, how did your real life affect maybe the story or did it affect anything in the book or? That's a phenomenal question. Um, I wrote the entire book during the pandemic. Um, it did absolutely affect me and the story. Um, it was, writing comedy is hard. I will say it's probably the hardest kind of writing I've ever had to do. Um, it's joyful and it's wonderful and I love it, um, but it's hard to pull off. It's, there are a lot of things that have to be just right yet to stick the landing. It's timing, it's pacing, it's voice. Um, and, and it can be, it's so easy to, to miss it. Um, and it was hard, right, you know, I, I said in a couple interviews, writing comedy is hard writing comedy when the world is on fire takes hard to a whole nother level. So, you know, you've got, I, you know, I was drafting this book and kind of coming up with these hilarious scenes and trying to write funny dialogue and to, to keep it light and keep it moving when um, everything's locking down and we've got the elections and no one's really sure if there's a vaccine coming. And, um, and the news was just this constant barrage of really, really negative, horrible stuff. And, and it was, there were nights when I would look at my computer screen and stare at the same screen for hours, like just the blank screen for hours. And I could not get my head in that place where I could imagine something funny. And, and that was the hardest thing. And, but it's a job at the end of the day, it's a job. I have a contract. I've got people expecting this book. I've got readers waiting on this book and I've got deadlines that just like Finley does, you know? And, um, and so at the end of the day, I had to, um, I had to show up and just do it, you know, button chair time and just write the story. Um, and I had to know when it was time to step away. I had to know when it was time to turn off the news. I had to know when it was time to watch a little something funny on TV to, you know, to relieve a pressure valve, you know, um, and it took me a little bit longer than maybe it would have otherwise. I'm super proud of it. And um, I hope it's funny. I hope it's, I hope it's hilarious. I hope it's a, as, as much fun for you all to read as it is for, was for me to, um, to read, you know, the, the final pass last week. Um, yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, it was it was absolutely written during a pandemic, and it's hard to know how much of that actually bled through. And I, I acknowledge it in my acknowledgments. The opening paragraph of my acknowledgments is this book was written during the COVID nineteen pandemic, um, and you know, I have the assurances of my publisher and my agent and all my critique partners that it's hilarious and fun and fast, and that my readers are going to fall in love with Vinley all over again. Um, but there's always that nagging doubt in the back of your mind that wonders, um, you know, where, where was my head for the last year and was it in a place where I could do this book justice? It's hard to know. Um, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to artists and creators 
who were able to create this year. It was not easy. So. I can only imagine. Well, I look forward to reading it in February. We were, uh, we had the pre-order link up in the group, so we are ready. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll book to answer the, the big cliffhanger question at, at the end of book one about her who put the head out or, or what can you tell us about book two, you know? Um, if you want, I will read you something that no one else has read. Oh, please. So today on Ed, and I didn't even know this was there until today, but today on Edelweiss, the book summary, you know, like the jacket copy was posted on Edelweiss. So I can actually read you the jacket copy if you guys want a little teaser. Yes, please. Okay. Finley Donovan is, once again, struggling to finish her next novel and keep her head above water as a single mother of two. On the bright side, she has her live-in nanny and confidant Vero to rely on, and the only dead body she's dealt with lately is that of her daughter's pet goldfish. On the not-so-bright side, someone out there wants her ex-husband Stephen out of the picture, permanently. Whatever else Stephen may be, he's a good father, and Finley is determined to keep him and her children safe. But doing so will lead her down a rabbit hole wherein soccer moms may be hit women in disguise and the Russian mob is much more involved than she would like them to be. Meanwhile, Vero's keeping secrets and Detective Nick Anthony seems determined to get back into her life. He may be a hot cop, but Finley's first priority is preventing her family from sleeping with the fishes. And if that means bending a few laws, then so be it. With her next book's deadline looming and an ex-husband to keep alive, Finley is quickly coming to the end of her rope. She can only hope there isn't a noose at the end of it. Oh, so exciting. <laughs> so yes, we get answers to certain elements of the mystery and we leave other elements of that mystery for book three. So I think everyone will be super satisfied um, you know that um, there's some really fun twists and reveals in this one. I think there are going to be some gaspy out loud moments, just like in book one, um, when you reach the end of the book and you're like, oh! and, you know, we've we've uh, we've definitely got some of those in here, and um, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, so I'm excited. I can't wait. It sounds like a book that I'd want to do a buddy read with, so that we can be reading along and gasping yeah. and sending each other messages like, did you? Can you imagine? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the cover of Finley Donovan like really blew up on Bookstagram with the the fun pictures. You know, every once in a while things blow up on Bookstagram and it's always so fun to watch them. And did, did you ever imagine that, I mean, that, that was gonna happen? <laughs> no, I mean, people are dressing their dogs. They're dressing their cats. How do you dress a cat? They're, <laughs> they're dressing their children as the cover of Finley Donovan. And it is the coolest, most, um, awe-inspiring thing, especially, you know, there are a lot of aspects of Finley's character as an author that came from my own experience as an author, like that feeling of like, you've got like three people reading your book and one of them is your mother, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, and so, um, you know, I've been writing for 10 years and, and I've, I've put out a lot of books, um, but I've never experienced um, the fandom that where people are just connecting so deeply with this book that, you know, they're, they're motivated enough to put on the clothes and take the pictures and, and, um, and share that love all over social media. It's amazing. Um, it's inspiring as it was probably the one thing that kept me going writing book two during the pandemic. Like really there were days when um, there were just really, really low days when I would just get on Instagram and you, you know, see someone's cat dressed like a, you know, with sunglasses and a black turtleneck and like, oh, I have to go back and write. Like I can't not write for these people. And so um, it's really, it's a special, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And I credit a lot of that enthusiasm to the success of the book overall. And the reason that we're able to extend the series um, because you, there are so many series that die very, very early on. The, the length of a series is entirely determined by the success of the first book. <laughs> and so the, if the first book doesn't come out of the gates and blow it out of the water, chances are it's going to fizzle pretty quickly. Um, the more enthusiasm, the more sales um, for book one, the longer the longevity of the series in general. So those kinds of posts and pictures and excitement and reviews 
um, create kind of a grassroots momentum and that velocity just keeps building. And that's what enabled us to be able to extend the series for book three and four. And so I am, um, I'm awestruck, but I'm also super grateful because um, it's, it's done wonders for this little book that could and, um, and I'm tickled by it. Mm. Yes, I love it. Uh, well, I mean, the book came out in February and here we are basically August. And to me, I mean, what my little corner of the world, it's still going strong. So that, that, that's impressive to me who reads, who we all read a lot of books and not a lot of books are still getting this amount of buzz six months, seven months down the road. So I you know, know I'm excited. I think I think so much of it is um, word of mouth and grassroots referrals and small book clubs. I visited, you know, so many small book clubs, six and seven people in their home on Zoom, and it's um, it's those kinds of um, group shares where you know people are telling their, you know, this is the kind of book where people want to tell their best friends and their moms and their high school friends and um, and in some cases their grandmas, and you know they're sharing the love of Finley with through word of mouth and that's really where we're seeing I think so much of our traction with this book is people getting excited and then telling everybody else about it and that's um, it's the best way um, to help um, authors who are not quite there yet in terms of you know the new authors debut authors authors who are kind of struggling you know to 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 get their books out there word of mouth is very very powerful and this is an example where we're really seeing it it's exciting yeah well we're getting down to the end of our chat i'm going to scroll back up through um i what other authors have been inspirations for your comedic writing oh wow i love this okay so um I love, 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 and have read for many years Janet Ivanovich, Stephanie Plum's books. They're some of my all-time favorites. And so, um, you know, when I was first looking at this, um, you know, trying to figure out where it was going to end up on a shelf, there were days when I was ready to give up because I was like, how am I going to sell a book when I don't even know really where to, where to shelve it? Like, it's very important in publishing that you have a shelf. So there are mysteries and they're thrillers and there's rom-com and um, in, you know, in YA, we tend to blend genre a lot. Um, it's because they all go on the teen shelf, right? So it doesn't matter if it's teen fantasy or, or, or if there's magic in it and kissing all in the same book, you know, everybody's good with that. But in the grown up world, everybody likes things very neatly boxed on the shelves. And so I really struggled when I was writing it to try to figure out what kind of book is this going to be. And it was looking at the Janet Ivanoviches who are out there who were able to write dark comedy, mystery, thriller, romance, all in the same book and still find a home for it that enabled me to say, I can keep going and somebody will want this. Somebody will publish it. Um, in, um, in other books, I love um, Dorinda Jones. If we have any Dorinda Jones fans, she actually I just, just read A Good Day for Chardonnay. Yes, yes, A Good Day. That's my weekend plan is A Good Day for Chardonnay. Um, so I love her books. I love her paranormal books also because I do love all different genres. And she's another great example of an author who does a really amazing job mashing that all together with a comedic edge. Um, and right now I'm reading a debut, um, A is for Auntie, or Dial A for Aunties. Mm -hmm. And that's so much fun. Um, and that's another great mashup where you've got like the romantic elements and the thriller elements and the comedic elements kind of all tied together. But um, so yeah, there are, there are a lot of folks out there, but if I had to say who was the inspiration that I kept looking to, um, I would say Janet Ivanovich was, you know, someone I've been reading for years that I really looked up to and admired when it came to that blend, that particular blend of voice. I definitely got that vibe, which I, I loved because I, I have an entire bookshelf that's just the, uh, the number series, so. Oh, and another one that I love um, that if you're into, if you're finding that you're really into this sort of thing, um, Lisa Lutz has this fantastic series. It's called The Spellman Files. It's super voicey. It's super fun. Um, the pacing is fantastic. The family dynamics are a hoot. I mean, I just roared. It's just hilarious. Um, and, and that's another really, really fun series if you like this style of book. Well, I'm taking notes as you were giving those. Um, are there any other books that you're currently reading and recommending or, or are those the 
so glad you asked. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, actually, well, I'm, I'm reading right now. I am I'm listening to Dial A for Aunties. Um, and this weekend, I'll be reading Durant Jones' A Good Day for Chardonnay. Um, I just finished rereading, um, and I think I've seen this bouncing around the Facebook um, page. I just finished rereading Such a Quiet Place. Um, and I read this one in draft form very early on when Megan was working on it, but the finished is phenomenal. Um, it is really, really, really so well done. Um, and, um, and I'm also wrapping up the Kiss Quotient because um, every now and again, I like a kissy book. Um, and what else have I, what else have I had on my um, reader on my audio lately? So yeah, so it's been, I've kind of been reading all over. Yeah, I see, I see fans of the Kish Quotient coming through. So yeah, it's a, um, it's a great book. And I, I sort of read all over the map, um, everything from YA to dark psychological suspense and dark thrillers. But my favorite reading are actually books that have not yet published. One of the coolest things about becoming an author is the opportunity to read books for blurbs mm -hmm. um, or to read for critique partners while they're developing their stories. So I get the opportunity um, very often to read books in their developmental stages in draft form or in copy edits for blurbs. Um, and so um, I've, actually probably 50-50 of my reading are books that are already published versus books that still have quite a ways to go that I could give you the names now, but the names would probably change. And I don't even know their publication dates, but I know they're coming and they're amazing. So, yeah. Well, um, you know, for the mamas who came to this live tonight, you know, Elle gave us a little teaser of her upcoming book and I will just go ahead and let this cat out of the bag that Megan will be joining us in October to come chat about such a quiet place. So Elle, please let her know how much fun you had with us tonight and tell her that we're looking forward to our chat with her then. Wonderful. Wonderful. And um, I have, I have that book on my TBR. So I'm glad to hear that you really enjoyed it. It's amazing. Um, it's amazing. So wrapping this up, what, give us um, Finley Donovan in three words, and then tell us how we can find you on socials. Oh my gosh, um, Finley Donovan in three words. Um, you can see. <laughs> a wild ride. Um, <laughs> and what was your other question? Uh, where can we find you on socials? Socials, I'm kind of everywhere. Um, and it's always El Cosimano, it's super easy. So um, you'll find me on Twitter at El Cosimano, on Instagram at El Cosimano, on uh, Facebook as El Cosimano. And I have a link tree in the bio of my Instagram that links to some really cool extras. Um, there's the Hit Moms Book Club, which was put together by my publisher. There are recipes, there are um, play, like music playlists, there are discussion questions for book clubs there. Um, so there are links to my website, links to my FAQs. So if you have burning questions that we didn't answer tonight, they're probably answered there. And you can see all of my other books there as well um, as news and important dates for upcoming publications. So. Um, so drop by and say hello. I'm on Instagram all the time engaging with readers. So please do tag me and say hello and I will give you a shout back. Fantastic. Well, as you can see, we are really excited for book two and we can't wait for the release date. And hopefully we can have you come back and chat with us a little bit more about Finley. I would love that. Thanks for reading everybody. All right. Thanks so much for your time, Al. We appreciate it. Great being here. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.